All righty, a good evening for the final time of the 2018-2019 school year. A greetings to you for our online review session and what will be our last online review session of the year. But of course, the most important online review session of the year because this is the huge, AP huge review. So that is what we are looking at right now for this review session. Again, this review session is going to be a little bit different than our review sessions of the past year, and that is because this is a question and answer session only. So we have this scheduled to go for an hour. Uh, we'll hopefully have as much questions to take us through that hour. Um, I'll try and expand on some things as the case may be from different perspectives at different points in times. So we'll kind of go off uh, on some tangents here, uh, hopefully all related tangents with any questions that you might have. But that's that's kind of the main idea behind tonight's online review session. So without any further ado, I am gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, and it looks like we got some uh, good questions in there to go ahead and start. And then so what I'll ask you all to do is as we go, if you have any questions, uh, to just go ahead and keep on asking them should you choose to. So that is what we got. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So our first question here uh, deals with what type of boundaries are the boundaries that are drawn after World 2? Well, there's two types of boundaries that are going to be drawn after, war, uh, after World War II. The first of boundary, of course, that's going to be drawn, and really there's two main types. And the first uh, the one we're looking at is that it there's antecedent boundaries, and there's, of course, your after boundaries, right? Your antecedent boundaries are drawn after human settlement. So the idea behind your antecedent boundaries, there are several types of those. The first one we're going to look at are relic boundaries. Now, those are boundaries that, of course, have been set up long before recorded history, uh, or not recorded history, but long ago, no longer uh, uses borders. So for example, the Great Wall of China is a relic boundary. Hadrian's Wall is a relic boundary. They don't serve their original purpose. The Great Wall of China, of course, is no longer an active wall in China to stop uh, people from coming into their area. So back to the question of boundaries drawn after World War II. Your boundaries drawn after World War II are going to be either one of two, and the those two types are going to be either a superimposed boundary or a consequent boundary. Now, let's take that consequent boundary first. A consequent boundary is a boundary that is drawn as a consequence of something. Basically, think of it this way. A consequent boundary is drawn as a consequence of usually events that are going on. So a great example of that is what happened post-World War II in India. And that occurred when there was this creation of Pakistan, where you had a Muslim portion of India, you had the Hindu portion of India. And to accommodate those existing differences, we saw a division between Muslim India and Hindu India. So that is a consequent boundary. They were drawn as a consequence of something. Now, the other type of boundary that might be drawn is a superimposed boundary. And a superimposed boundary is the idea that you are going to draw a boundary without regards for cultural differences. Essentially, you're just plopping that boundary down with little regard for the consequences. So while they're similar in the sense that human settlement has already occurred, they're different in the sense that those boundaries, one is being drawn to accommodate boundaries, the other is being drawn to uh, with without regard of boundaries. Those are two very different reasons why your boundaries are drawn. Good question on question number one. If you're following on the um, uh, Google Doc here, we're going to be on the question number two right now, which is, could you go into depth 
about the Zelensky's model or Zelensky's transition model, migration transition model. And we absolutely can do that. The Zelensky's migration transition model basically corresponds to the demographic transition model. So it takes the stages of the demographic transition model and talks about the migration patterns at each stage. It basically tries to correlate, if you will, those migration patterns. Why are mo certain migration patterns happening at each stage? So let's go through those. So let's go tell you in stage one, there's not a lot of migration. In matter of fact, the migration that's going on is perhaps hunting and gathering, but also perhaps some very low migration patterns. The reason why you're more worried about survival. You're an agricultural society at that point in time. So you're not really concerned with a lot of large scale movement. All right, migration number two, stage two of the demographic transition model. Zelensky's gonna tell you that that's where you're gonna see with this industrialization process going on, that's where you're gonna see a lot of net out migration. These are going to be areas where all of a sudden there's a, this industrial process going on, but there's too many people. Why? Because remember, in the demographic transition model, that birth rate has stayed the same, which is very high, but the death rate has gone down, which means you have this excess amount of people, too many people, too little jobs. So in stage two of the Zelensky's migration transition model and the um, demographic transition model, you're going to see people leaving to go to stage four countries. Why? We'll get to that momentarily. Stage three, that's where we're going to see this kind of really heavy move to the city. We're going to see this move to the city. So internally, there's some movement going on in there. But, but we're also still seeing a little bit of that net out. Towards the end of stage three, we're going to see a suburbanization process occur end of stage three, beginning of stage four. And in stage four, that's where we're going to see the stage two migrants go to. So stage four sees the recipients of, is the recipients of stage two migrants. Why? Because they have a a population that has stabilized. They need to have more people fill those jobs, but they're not getting their own native born population to do that. So instead they need migrants to come to that country, perhaps do jobs that are not as desirable. And what we're also gonna see in stage four, that continue to move the suburbs, people moving from the city into the suburbs and kind of getting that bigger space uh, ironically, with a smaller family, but that's a question for another point in time. All right, so that is the look at the Zelensky migration transition model and how it compares to the demographic transition model. Good question there to combine two things, population and migration. Would be interesting to see if that could possibly be uh, something on a um, free response question. All right, question number three. What is the difference between the J curve and S curve in doubling time? Great question. If you think of it this way, you got to take the J curve, uh, you got to take uh, the letter J, right? And you got to kind of make it perpendicular. And if you make a J curve perpendicular, what you see is the idea that this is going up. And so it's going up, but then it kind of levels off a little bit. And that's that J, right? Where it goes up and it kind of levels off. So that's your classic what's happening to your po total population in the demographic transition model, where it kind of goes up and then kind of levels off. And then at the end, in stage five, it's going to even kind of uh, drop down a little bit. Your S curves, that's going to be your stage one and stage four, where your birth rates are fluctuating up and down like an S, right? If you were to take an S, but then kind of again, put it flat, that you're going to see that up and down. So here's the deal with doubling time. In a J curve, a J curve would have a much shorter doubling time because that population is going up much faster. An S curve is going to have a much longer doubling time because of the fact that those birth rates and death rates are fluctuating so much. So again, if you kind of uh, draw it out and write a J and then kind of twist your paper or you put an S and then twist your paper, that kind of looks like a J and S curve or it kind of looks like the total population and it also looks like the um, 
uh, uh, birth and death rates going on. All right. Question number four. What is the main cause of Lutheranism in the Midwest? Lutheranism in the Midwest, of course, this comes from a previous uh, free response question. Why is Lutheranism in the Midwest? Well, Lutheranism is in the Midwest because of the fact that you have chain migration. You see, Lutherans predominantly come from German descent. There's a lot of German descent in the Midwest. Why? Because you had this original kind of cluster of German migrants that went into the Midwest, areas like Minnesota and Wisconsin um, and North Dakota and South Dakota. And so they went there to be farmers, similar to what they were doing in Germany. So basically you have people that went from one country that were doing kind of this kind of um, agrarian lifestyle. They went to another country doing an agrarian lifestyle and they took their religion with them, much like why we see a large increase in Catholicism in the Southwest, and we also saw an increase of Catholicism in the Northeast, right? No different than the, the exact reason why Lutherism is in the Midwest, it's the exact reason why you also have Catholicism in the Northeast. You have Catholic immigrants, uh, excuse me, of Irish immigrants who took their Catholicism with them when they went to Boston, when they went to New York. They brought the religion with them, and bam, that's where you have your major hotspots of Catholicism. So really, it's not just uh, with Lutheranism. It's not just with Catholicism. It's with any religion. Any migrant is going to bring their religion and their religious backgrounds with them. And if they bring their religion and they bring their religious backgrounds with them, they're going to to when they move, that's where you're gonna see some hot butts of that. And then why is it so big? Chain migration. When one group moves, another group moves over as well with them. So that's a good question. That is question number four. Question number five brings us up to what is the difference between sight and situation? So sight versus situation. Sight factors are going to be factors that are physical characteristics of an area. These are things like your topography. These are things like your climate. These are things like your soil condition. The site factors are specific, unique characteristics, physical characteristics of that area. It's a way to describe a place. It's a way to describe your place. Situational factors are your description of your place relative to other things. Now, don't confuse situation and relative location because that's a little bit different. Relative location, you're going to be using more kind of things um, where you're describing um, the other things in relation to you. So for our school, for example, as we use so much, we might say down the street from the embassy car wash down the road from the um, McDonald's, right? Next to the post office, next to the government center. Those are kind of relative to other things. Your situation is when you're describing your location, but you're doing it in a more, not only exact way, but you're also doing it in a way that is more specific than your relative because you're going to use other types of things. You're going to say, for example, 100 miles from um baltimore or you're gonna say 100 miles from richmond you're gonna say five miles north on old keen mill so it's a type of relative location yes but it's also you're describing more of your location not the location kind of in things relative to you so that's the difference between the two between situation and site now site that um sibling if you will to site is going to be your absolute location absolute location your physical exact location on the earth's surface not really changing so the idea behind your site of course with your physical characteristics is like your mathematical location your uh physical address or you're going to use your latitude and longitude to describe those two. So those are things to think about in that regard. Situation, obviously more close to relative location as well. Remember, relative location can change depending on the relatives, right? So that kind of looks at that. All right, we're moving on to question number six right now. How do gentrification and redlining affect cities 
and neighborhoods. Gentrification and redlining are big factors that are occurring in the cities of America. So let's take a look at each of those. Gentrification is when you have kind of middle class people, upper middle class people, or upper class people are going to an area that has typically been regarded as a less well-off socioeconomic place. What happens is the people come into this area and they begin to fix up the neighborhood. They begin to kind of make um, perhaps more high-end stores. They begin to uh, fix their housing up. There's a large influence in socioeconomic funds, in economic funds. What happens is by doing this, you start to see the neighborhood be affected because quickly, People that used to live there for a long period of time when the neighborhood was not in a great uh, situation are now forced out because rents are going to be higher because of this new hot spot area in the city. Taxes are going to go up, so people might not be afford to live there that used to be able to live there. And there's overall a general what we would think of as improvement of that area, but it comes at a large cost because in many cases the stuff that's being placed there are things like um are not things that are kind of native to that native to that area so you're going to see this is where you're going to see pop culture come into effect so gentrification leads continued pop culture I'll give an example in u street um dc uh this area used to be or uh, sorry excuse me in columbia heights used to not be such a great area. I actually did some student teaching work there when I was in college. Shortly after I stopped doing some work there uh, and I came out to West Springfield, they were doing, they, they put a target in there. And that target really kind of turned around that area. People were looking for a little bit cheaper place to live. Target comes in, all of a sudden more people want to kind of be where the, this target is. And this area that was not in the best of shape got turned around a little bit, but what happened there is the people there kind of got forced out and went to another portion of the city. So gentrification, while we can think of the fact that it improves neighborhoods, it also tears neighborhoods apart because people who used to live there are not able to live there any longer. Cities like gentrification because it helps out create a larger tax base, provides more services, but it does so with a large portion, with a large price to pay. Redlining is a practice that is supposed to be outlawed by banks, where banks would back in the day zone out areas of a city that and they placed quite literally a red line where they would refuse to lend money to this area. Now, that's hugely important because if you're refusing to lend money to an area, then that area cannot be gentrified. Because if you are not allowed, if you're not lending money to that area, then that area can't be fixed up. What would happen is that area would go into disarray. The bank would take it over. They would sell it to somebody else um, at a you know at a, at, a, at a cheaper cost for them at a larger profit. And then what they would do is they would kind of uh, move on to the next area. Now, redlining again is illegal, but it, what that did it also destroyed neighborhoods as well with the idea that you were taking away what was this cultural local folk culture if you will these little folk neighborhoods that were kind of destroyed in that regards all right the different city models what is their what is the different city models and what is their purpose for each one all right big question here with city models so there's a couple that we want to focus on First, we're going to focus on the concentric zone model. Of course, the concentric zone model was developed by this guy named Burgess. And his belief is that when you look at a city, you can see that it's built on a series of rings. Now, it's not so much in the physical sense. It's not like if you were to fly over the city, you could like see this per se. It's more in things like census tracts. You're looking at things like marriage rates, uh, economic status, um, uh, uh, what what it's zoned as residential or it's zoned as um, industrial or it's zoned as um, commercial or those types of things. Bottom line is that the Burgess model, what Burgess said, the concentric zone model is that there's a series of rings, that there's this central business district in the center, 
And then, of course, on the outside, you have this zone of transition. You have this kind of workers' homes and these wealthier homes out uh, as you go a little bit further out. Now, typically speaking, we're going to see this occur in um, European areas where that central business district really is kind of focused on this um, old city structure, this old religious center, this old central business district, we're really going to see this focus in on. So your older cities, I like to think things like New England towns in America are good examples of this Burgess concentric zone model. The Hoyt sector model uh, is probably the easiest to identify because we, we the thing that makes it different from the other models we're going to talk about here is that the Hoyt sector model quite literally has a sector there. It has a transition, a transportation sector where it's getting goods in and out. So the transportation goes to the central business district and it goes out again. Things like roads and railroads, perhaps even a river uh, is going to be with the sector model. This was really big in Latin American cities because the idea was to get goods in and out from back when it was set up in colonial and imperial times. So we see that occur, this really kind of plaza. And what we see here too is that in the sector model is that it's not just a transportation sector. It's also a sector that goes right to the downtown area of not great housing. Then there's a sector of good housing. There's a sector of middle class housing. The idea being that it goes directly down to the downtown area. That's huge. That's not something that we see uh, happen uh, in the concentric zone model where it's a series of rings. Our third major one, of course, was the multiple nuclei model. And this Ullman multiple nuclei model is that the cities of Burgess, the cities of Hoyt, where there's one sector, there's one CBD that drives everything, is no more. What they'll say is that the, that that was a thing of the past. That instead, cities today, different areas have different things going on in it. So one area might be the industrial center of the city. Another area might be the residential area of the city. Another area might be the big um, uh, commercial district of the city. So the idea behind the multiple nuclear model is that it's not just one area that's driving everything, it's multiple areas that are driving everything. Good example to look at this is of course with our ethnic neighborhoods, where you see that ethnic neighborhoods are not just in one area, but there are pockets all around over there. There's also a, excuse me, a galactic city model where basically that this city, the CBD once again is not really relevant anymore and instead, what you see is kind of these edge cities that develop, where what's happened is instead of going to the downtown area of these cities, these edge cities, which are connected by a beltway, DC is a great example of this, that people don't need to go to the downtown area anymore. If we want to go shopping in a high-end area, we don't need to go downtown. We can go to Tyson's Corner. Or we can go to Springfield Town Center. So the idea is that the edge cities have now competed, if you will, with the... Um, with the um, main CBD. There's also the urban realms model, which is kind of similar to the multiple nuclear model, where there's kind of blobs, right? Where each area has one and it kind of forms together to almost look at this really uh, functional region, if you will, in that regard. As opposed to the world, there's the African city model. There's also um, a um, uh, Asian sector model, which is very similar to the sector model as well. Uh, so I invite you to go ahead and take a look at uh, the season urban land use PowerPoint from period seven. They had a really good look at that on your Google Classroom. So the idea of those multiple, uh, the idea of those city models, though, is it's a way to try and understand the city about why are certain things going on in there. Burgess, again, would tell you that it's rings, that you can really tell a city by its rings. Hoyt says, no, it's really by sectors, right? And then a um, multi-nuclear model and so on and so forth. So it's a good area to weigh. Again, the overall idea is to try and explain those cities. Good example on that. All right, we're on question number eight. What was Thomas Malthus's theory or belief on population. Thomas Malthus believed that America, or th that not America, America was around when Thomas Malthus was around. Thomas Malthus believed that population was growing exponentially and that 
food was growing arithmetically. So what Malthus believed is that there was eventually going to come a day in which we would run out of food on earth. That people, since we produce exponentially two, four, six, eight at a time, but that food grows up one, two, three, four, that there was going to come a point in which people would run out of food. And it was called the Malthusian trap, where people would basically be fighting over this food. What happens, though, of course, is Malthus way overestimates the population, but he underestimates the people's ability to do two things. Number one, Malthus doesn't take into account things like canning, things like preservatives, things like um, refrigeration, which all enable us to preserve our food for longer periods of time. So we can sustain the large population that we have because we have preservation, because we have refrigeration. So it's not like we have to worry about rationing out beef when we just put the beef, whatever we're not gonna eat, we put it in the freezer and freeze it for a short period of time. That was not around during Malthus's time. The second thing Malthus didn't, uh, did not count on is the fact that humans could control their reproduction with things like the birth control pill, condoms, all these types of things that were not around during Malthus's time that allows us to now instead control our population growth. Malthus basically didn't realize that people would not want to have kids or that kids would not be as a necessity as they once were. So there are people out there today that are called neo-Malthusians and neo-Malthusians are those folks that believe the population is a population explosion is a real thing. Maybe not in the more developed world, but in the developing world, that's where we're seeing these things happen. That's where we're seeing these things go on. So the, the so the idea of um, having these um, populations uh, grow unchecked is not a big thing. There are still folks out there that say that we need to worry about our population growing in the developing world, affecting other resources. Uh, but for right now, Malthus's beliefs are um, pretty disregarded in that regards. There were other critics, of course, like Karl Marx, who said, no, we did have enough food. We just needed to share it a little bit more equally, more so than we did. Question number nine, what is the purpose of the United Nations and what type, which type of super or supranational organization is it? The United Nations is a supranational organization that is a political supranational organization. Oh, by the way, going back to Malthus for one second, just wanted to talk about um, Malthus would, was what we call an anti-natalist. He believed that people should um, not have as many kids. There are countries out there that are struggling with anti-natalist policies so much that they are now pro-natalist, which means they need to have more kids. Russia, for example, has pro-natalist policies out there to try and encourage people to have kids. Of course, the largest anti-natalist population, or anti-natalist pr uh, program that people are aware of is China's one child policy. Um, all right, so sorry, going back to question number nine here. What is the purpose of the United Nations and which type of super national organization is it? The United Nations is a political organization. Its main goal is to provide peace. It is not a military organization. The military it has is a strictly peacekeeping force. So they are not to engage. They are instead to respond. So that not does not make them a military organization. The NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, for example, is a military organization because it encourages kind of this military um, kind of uh, activeness, if you will. But the main purpose of the United Nations is a political supranational organization. What is a supranational organization? A supranational organization is a group of countries that are working together towards a common goal. There's political organizations like the United Nations, there are military organizations like NATO, but there's also things uh, like economic supranational organizations like OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or the EU, or NAFTA. The idea, of course, behind OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is that they're working together to set the price for the, um, they're working together to set the price for the 
price of foil to set uh, that. So they are working together. The European Union, they are working together towards the betterment of the European economy, the European economy as a whole. So those are things to think about. So when we look at supranational organizations, they're working together. The opposite of that, of course, is devolution. Devolution is the idea of having a state gradually give up power, not towards a higher level, but instead towards a lower level. So devolution, for example, is when you would give control to regions supranet within your country. So if you have an ethnic group that is perhaps agitating for independence, the idea is that maybe you give them some, some a little bit more uh, rights, that way they kind of don't fight back on you and they kind of leave you be. But when we talk about supranational organizations, you're giving up power at the state level, but you're giving up to a higher level. Um, supranational organizations um, work together for a very limited cause, not something that countries are seemingly all that willing to give up their power to. Question number 10, can you go in more depth on three agricultural revolutions? There are three of them. The first agricultural revolution, that's back in the day, way back in the day, ninth grade world history one, as a matter of fact, the idea of having this moving from hunting and gathering to actual um, regular farming uh, with the domestication of animals. So you're actually being sedentary instead of a forager, you're being a sedentary. That's agricultural revolution number one. Uh, most of the world's history is gonna be spent in that first agricultural revolution. And it's not until, oh, the, oh, I don't know, 15, 1600, maybe a little bit past that, where we get to the second agricultural revolution. And the second agricultural revolution is where we th see things like the impact of the industrial revolution. We see towards the very end of the second agricultural revolution, mechanized farming using machines. Uh, we also see things like crop rotation, things like fertilizer use in the second agricultural revolution. The idea of how can we be more efficient, that's kind of the big hallmark of the second agricultural revolution. How can we be more efficient? By having crop rotation, we can save our fields. We don't have to worry about it uh, losing nutrients. If we have fertilizers, which is also in the second agricultural revolution, we can maybe get a little bit more yields per uh, area. Mechanized farming, of course, we can grow more in a bigger area with less human work. So that's the second agricultural revolution. The third agricultural revolution, we're in the midst of right now. So you all live in exciting times when it comes to agriculture because of sometimes known as the green revolution, where we are using, uh, we are using um, genetics to try and be once again more efficient with our agriculture. So things like seedless watermelons, things like seedless cucumbers, seedless grapes, where we're modifying the genetic structure so that way we can have food that's more um, easy for us for the most part. But at the same point in time, what we're seeing here is an agricultural process that is also easier for transportation as well. So Square watermelons, for example. So you can transport square watermelons much easier than you can transport your round watermelons. The big thing, of course, about the Green Revolution is the genetically modified foods. Some people do not want genetically modified modified food because of course the safety hazards or what might be the safety hazards. So that's one of the things that we see uh, that's a big issue um, is what will this entail? Other things like the Green Revolution, things like fish farming. So we normally think of farming with, with ground, dirt and plants, but things like fish farming, another part of the agricultural revolution where you're kind of harvesting fish uh, as well. So that's the big things of those three revolutions. All right, question number 11 puts us almost halfway there. Um, what, uh, what is the difference between a federal state and a unitary state? A federal state is a state in which the power, the power lies, excuse me, both with the um, local governments and with the central government. So America, for example, is a federal state because our state and local governments share power with the central government. Is the central government still supreme in a federal state? Yes, it is. However, local and states still have their own powers and in some cases, unique powers. Any state, 
any state, meaning not state United States, any state as in country state, any country that has provinces or regional or states like we have, that is a federal state. So America is a federal state, of course. Canada is a federal state. Mexico is also a federal state as well, where they have um, little kind of regions within their countries or provinces in their countries. They have states uh, as well. So the idea behind a federal state, um, why we see this trend towards a federal state is that going back to our question of uh, um, a little while ago in question number nine about the United Nations is that more and more we see states trying to be kept together by giving up some power at the central level to appease local authorities, to appease local ethnic groups, to appease local nationalities. So that way you can maintain this greater state, but still give up a little bit of power. And what's happened though, is that sometimes we've seen these federal states further devolve into even separate states. And that was a big thing in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, they had a central control and they tried federal for a little bit. And then after a while, there was complete separation with a breakdown. And that, of course, is what we know as a balkanization. All right, unitary state, that's where you have one central government. You might have local kind of states, but they don't have any real power. That the power, the main overarching power relies at the unitary level, that it's the main central government has the most control of it. That is something that is one of the big things that we see uh, in kind of old countries where you have these empires, where it's one major area in control, the unitary state, that main area. All right, question number 12, what is Rostow's model? Rostow's model is also known as the international trade model. And the idea behind Rostow's model is trying to find what you do best. What do you do better than everybody else's? And how can you make sure that your country is benefiting from that? So when we look at the Rostow model, for example, we're talking about things like oil production in the Middle East, of using their oil in order to develop other sectors. So instead of like the self-sufficiency approach where you try and kind of develop all sectors evenly, the international trade model says, let's find a way to develop our country using what we have, do it better than everybody else, and then develop in other things. As we talked about before, um, the self-sufficiency approach is not a successful thing because you're trying to be good at everything. In actuality, you wind up being good at nothing. But the idea of the Rostow model is find something you're good at, use that money to develop other sectors, and then so that way you can kind of become a little bit more well-balanced, but don't start off doing it that way. So that's the Rostow model of development. And many countries have done it and used it successfully, not just the Middle East, but also things like in Asia, where they capitalized on their uh, comparative advantage, which of course was not as many um not as many uh, or uh, many workers. Um, so they use their low, cheap labor as a way to develop other sectors of their economy. All right, question number 13, what is, what is the significance of the core peripheral model? So the core, per, the core periphery model is a part of the Wallerstein theory, which is the idea that you have a more developed core and then a less developed periphery. And the core got that way because of the periphery, and now the core kind of supports the periphery. And again, we've seen this time and time again, we've talked about this in the case of Northern Virginia and the rest of Virginia. Northern Virginia, of course, is our core, right? It's what provides a lot of the state, provides a lot of the population of the rest of the state, and there's a periphery out there. However, the periphery supports the core with other things. In our case, it'd be things like, um, agriculture and manufacturing, where we, of course, have more of the cities idea. Core peripheral model starts not just at a state level, it also starts on a national level as well. So, of course, if we look at America, core peripheral model starts with that megalopolis in the Northeast Corridor, where you have Boston down to DC, that's a part of the core peripheral model. We also see it 
in um, the world as well, where the Northern Hemisphere is considered the core, the Southern Hemisphere considered the periphery. But the idea is that the core has been developed and you have a less developed periphery and the core kind of supports that less developed periphery after they kind of used it to take from that. All right, question number 15, what are the different types of agriculture and in what area of the world are they distributed in? Two main types of agriculture, of course, we have are the, oh, sorry, I skipped uh, number 14. Let me go back to 14, then we'll move on to 15. Number 14, what is a primate city and the rank size rule? So your primate city is the idea that you have one city that is far more developed than any other city. Um, in your country. The rank size rule is that your countries kind of follow this nice kind of tiered approach. So primate city would be in Mexico City in Mexico, where they have a city larger than any other city by far within their country. Rank size rule would be an area like Germany, where they kind of have cities of not equal size, but you have a big city and then it kind of goes down in a nice tiered approach. So if your top city is 10 million, your next city might be 5 million. Your city after that might be 2.5, this nice tiered approach. The rank size rule is something you see with a little bit older cities where it kind of took a chance to develop a little bit. Newer, faster growing countries are going to have primate cities. A lot of the less developed world, the developing world has primate cities because uh, there's one city that kind of is the main nucleus. Now, the primate city is good because you have everything in one one area, um, your economic, your political, your social is all in one area, but it's also bad too because if that primate city is not going well, then the entire country is not doing well. Rank size rule, you're much more likely to have this spread out approach where you have one area might be a political area, one area might be a social area, one area might be a cultural area, um, economic area, so on and so forth. So you'll definitely see that happen uh, in there. So again, though, one quick thing on the rank size rule, the rank size rule is not a perfect Fit, right? So it's not like if it has one city has 10 million and the next one has six, oh, it's got to be a primate city. No, uh, it's ranked size. It's not, again, it's not perfect. It's just an idea. All right. Now we're on to question number 15. What, which are the different types of agriculture and in what areas uh, of the world are they distributed in? All right. So agriculture, the two main types of agriculture are, of course, commercial and subsistence. Commercial agriculture is when you have agriculture to sell off of the farm. Your subsistence agriculture, you're farming for survival. Commercial agriculture can be practiced in more developed countries, developed countries, less developed countries, developing countries are going to practice subsistence agriculture. The main types of subsistence agriculture are extensive agriculture, which is your area where you're taking up lots of land, but not getting a lot out of that land. Things like, for example, slash and burn, letting fields fallow, pastoral nomadism, where you have this migration of animals, this herding of animals. Um, that is extensive subsistence agriculture. Intensive subsistence agriculture makes up the vast majority of agriculture, and that is going to be your working very hard, small plots of land, um, uh, getting a, a lot out, but again, they're small plots of land. Intensive subsistence agriculture practice a lot in South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, in Northeast Asia, kind of where Mongolia is. That's where you have your pastoral nomadism. Uh, and then in your subsistence, uh, extensive agriculture, slash and burn, interior part of Africa, interior part of uh, Latin America. Um, plantation agriculture is a type of commercial agriculture, but it's done in developing countries in which developing peoples work on that, but it's not for their benefit, it's for other people's benefit, and that occurs in the tropic regions. All right, commercial agriculture occurs in your um, uh, developed countries of the world. Of course, we have mixed, we have mixed crop livestock. We have um, the herding of animals. We have uh, grain agriculture. And of course, we have your forestry. Now, those things are going to occur um, as, of course, to the von Thunen model, which I would, of course, encourage you to take a further look at. Um, the agriculture that occurs 
uh, in and around cities. That's going to be your ex that's going to be your uh, intensive um, dairying. That's also going to be your mixed crop livestock. This is going to be your area where you need to get kind of close because uh, that's where it is, uh, as opposed to further away, where that's going to be a little bit more spread out because you need more land. Um, of course, America, our um, our mixed crop and livestock occurs kind of in that Ohio Midwest area. We, of course, know the extensive in the Great Plains area, the ranching, of course, which is further out from that. We see that happen as well. And again, this occurs more on a continental uh, area. So take a look at that. Question number 16, what is the Rust Belt or Brownfields? The Rust Belt is an area of the Midwest, thinking about areas like Ohio, um, thinking about areas like Michigan, uh, in which uh, Indiana, to an extent, in which you've seen people lose manufacturing jobs thanks to the move of people um where there's this um idea of this is where manufacturing used to be thanks to uh, transnational corporations which have moved manufacturing areas to areas where there's cheaper labor this type these rust belts are where manufacturing places have left and what we see is that people are leaving the rust belt they are migrating away from the Rust Belt to areas for other jobs. Now, what we've seen is that within the Rust Belt, we've seen that the Rust Belt's gone down, but that the Sun Belt has gone up. What is the Sun Belt? The Sun Belt is the area of um, the Southeast that has gotten some of the manufacturing jobs because they're non-union jobs, but also because people have retired there as well. All right, question number 17, techno poles, and what are some of the desired or unwanted effects of them? Techno poles are areas where You've seen a high the concentration of technology jobs, things like Silicon Valley, the research center. The undesired, the desired aspect is that it's very high quality labor. The undesired aspect is that it's caused housing prices in areas to go up exponentially. Think about things like Seattle and their housing prices thanks to Microsoft and Amazon. Think about Silicon Valley outside of San Francisco with their huge prices. Um, the idea behind the Technopoles is that it's good again because you have these highly desirable jobs uh, with high quality jobs, but it's also bad because it's jacked up the housing prices a lot, which causes some problems. Question number 18, can you explain the Weber's least cost theory? Um, Weber's, uh, sorry, uh, question number 18, can you explain what the export processing zones are and what are their importance? The export processing zones are areas outside of a country's border where they maintain exclusive right to export things that are created within that area. I'll give an example, outside of the US border, Borders, if there's oil found offshore, if there are um, deep sea, you know, if there's fishing or whatever that occurs there, that's considered American territory. It's important because countries like China, for example, are building islands to extend their export processing zones and claim things, claim areas that might not be theirs. It also means they can control trade as well uh, to decide what counts as trade coming into their country and what counts as trade not coming into their country. So it's super important because it's a way for countries to expand upon their boundaries, uh, especially at the ocean level, where uh, historically uh, there's not been as much um, importance placed on those boundaries. But as the lands have become settled and those boundaries have become much more definitive, the ocean boundaries have become a lot bigger. Question number uh, 19, again, I guess, which is not technically 19, but we'll call it that. What are some of the issues relating to Weber's least cost theory? Weber's least cost theory is like any model in the sense that it does not take into account many factors. Things like, for example, um, labor. What if there's not skilled labor? What if there's high demand of labor? It also take, doesn't take into account things like um multiple markets uh and it doesn't really take into a part international trade either uh weber's least cost theory of course looks at three different things it looks at the production of goods it looks at the labor that goes into it and it looks at the raw materials so weber's least cost really has some issues very similar to the von Thunen models and it makes a lot of major assumptions um on things 
wages are universal. There's no trade or the trade is heavily regulated or there's uh, only certain areas where this material can come from. Um, those types of things. So those are things to look at. Question number uh, 19, I think I already did. What are the major agricultural types and crops found in each region of the world? Did that. Question number 20, what is Waller Systems World System Theory? What does it look like? How can we use it at a country scale? What are the label trends of this model and what are the criticisms? All right, Wallerstein's world system theory is not really any different from the core periphery model. The idea that you have this core area, the core area is found in the Northern hemisphere. So it's basically if you take the US you take Europe and you make a circle around that, the uh, Europe uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, England and France and Germany, if you, draw a, if you draw a circle around that, everything on the outside is considered the periphery, everything on the inside is considered the core. And so what Wallerstein says, again, is that it's the core that's developed at the expense of the periphery, that the core has become this area in which they consume but the periphery provides and what wallerstein will say is that that is a problem because the core continues to take and this is a criticism is that it takes and takes and takes without providing to the periphery the labor trends of that market are the fact that the periphery goes to the core for work because that's where a lot of the work is occurring in so it's the raw materials that are being taken from the periphery but it's the core that's being more and more developed at the expense of the periphery so the labor trends are the people are leaving that area there's brain drain occurring as well and at the country scale we of course see it once again with that northeast corridor uh, and of course to an extent on the west coast where it's the where we have we even have a term for the core periphery in america we call it flyover country where people are going away from those areas going more and more towards the coast more and more towards city areas now of course there are exceptions but by and large we're seeing that occur all right question number 21 what are the models of cities in the middle east uh latin america and asia middle east is going to follow more of a core periphery uh sorry more core periphery more of a concentric zone model Latin America, more of a sector model. And of course, Asia, more of a sector model as well. Uh, I invite you again, uh, as I mentioned before, to look at that city's um, uh, PowerPoint that was provided for us by period seven that has a really good uh, series of those models. We're on question number 22. What are the spatial patterns of good consumption around the world? All right, um, in the more developed portions of the world, the goods that are being consumed are these high tech consumer goods. So America, Europe, uh, East Asia now are consuming consumer goods, things that uh, companies are making, people are making for people's entertainment, for people's enjoyment. And it's in other parts of the world where you have consumption that is more of a done for survival. These are, of course, are still agricultural regions of the world, interior parts of Latin America, we're also talking about the idea of um, we're also talking about the idea of um, uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well, where we see this uh, kind of going on. We also see a uh, we also see a uh, uh, secondary um, goods being produced. These are your heavy industry goods being produced, and these are areas, for example, in Eastern Europe. It's also areas to a lesser extent going on in. Uh, parts of Asia as well. Uh, but the idea of good consumptions is that once again, it's the more developed world that's consuming a lot more of these goods, which means they're taking more electricity, which means they're taking more resources. Um, and again, it's being done at the expense of the periphery. All right. The question number 23 was the galactic city model. A galactic city model, of course, is um, the idea that you have this um, city that's in the center, kind of by suburbs, but then you also have on the outside these edge cities that are developing, where you don't have to worry about the, um, uh, you have kind of, if you think about it this way, it's they're each, they each other in their own galaxies. So each of them has their own city, uh, their own little central business district, their own little 
um, importance as well. And again, that comes at the expense of the city. So if you live in between those two, you can decide do you want to go to the city or do you want to go to the edge city. But of course, you don't see that happen at a later point in time. Uh, city that follows this model. DC is a good example uh, of that model with our edge cities that we have. And uh, last question here, question number 24 uh, is what is the gravity model? And the gravity model, of course, is the idea that um, if you have two cities, if you are between two cities, you are going to go to the bigger one and the closer one. Now, if you look at an example like DC and uh, Richmond, for example, if you live in Fredericksburg, DC is bigger than Richmond is. DC might have more than Richmond does. However, if Richmond has something that's like DC's, but Richmond's a little bit easier, a little bit closer to get to, then you're gonna be more attracted to it. If you think about it like gravity, you're more attracted to the bigger area as well as the area you are kind of have greater, uh, the, the, the bigger area and the area that uh, can provide a greater connection or it's closer to, is what I'm trying to say here. So for example, our gravity model means we're heavily attracted to DC. People who live between here and Baltimore, again, it's one of those things where Baltimore might have something a little bit better than D.C. does. So that might kind of pull them towards that if they're in the middle. But the idea is that if you're closer to a big city, all things being equal, you're going to go to the bigger city that is uh, that you have a greater connection to. I like to think of it as the grandparent model. Think about which grandparents you're closer to, the ones that you live closer to and that are easier to get to is how, uh, how the gravity model goes. And that, my friends, is, I think, the last question that was on there. Um, and it did not seem, I was monitoring it pretty close, it did not seem as if people had uh, further questions as we were moving uh, along here. So, with that being said, I will, for the last time, um say uh thank you for watching i uh, hope you found this to be beneficial uh or of course continue to take more of your questions if i have you in class we'll need to take more of those questions uh in the next little while and we will say goodbye to you for now and we'll say good luck to all and see you next time thank you for watching and for the final time this is Mr. Swain signing off for an online review session. Last one, 2018, 2019. Good night, and more importantly, good luck.